Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. In those days, actually, verse 13. Exactly. Then Jesus came from Galilee at, uh, to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had baptized Jesus, he came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. When he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. When the tempter came to him, he said, If you're the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. Then he said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you. And... In their hands, they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, It is written, again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you fall down and, what? Worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. And then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. And Lord, we pray now as we open the word that your spirit would speak to us, Instruct us, Lord, and how we can effectively resist the temptations we all face. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you have ever been bombarded or faced temptation? Really? Not all hands went up. How many of you have ever successfully overcame temptation. Listen, I think that every single one of us must understand we all have been tempted, and by the grace of God, I would say the majority of us have overcome temptation. As long as we live in a fallen world, as long as we're in these fallen bodies, we will face temptation. It's a fact. And yes, even pastors and leaders are tempted. I heard the story of a pastor he was on his way to a, uh, an appointment visiting someone at the hospital. After circling the building looking for a parking lot for 20 minutes, decided to park in a no parking zone. And when he left the car, he left a note. And the note said, I've circled around this parking lot for 10 times and could not find a parking spot. And he wrote the scripture, forgive us our trespasses. Well, after he came back, meeting that person at the appointment, he found a ticket on his windshield wiper. And the ticket at the bottom says, I've been circling this building for 10 years. And then he wrote the scripture, lead us not unto temptation. 
Listen, every one of us, regardless of who you are, regardless of how mature you are in Christ, regardless if you know the Lord for a, a short time or known the Lord a long time, you and I will face temptation. The question is, what will you do when you face it? The Bible tells us in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 12, blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life. So, as we look at Jesus in this chapter, we're going to consider Jesus successfully navigated and overcame temptation and how you and I can do the same. I know for me, one of my greatest times of temptation is actually in October. We have here at the church the Harvest Festival. And in the course of preparing for the Harvest Festival, we encourage the church to bring candy for the Harvest Festival. By the end of the month, there's stacks of it in the office. And upon occasion, there's this overwhelming sense of needing to leave my chair at my desk, go by the box where the, where the candy is at, and I just, well, I look at it. <laughs> and then I, there's a verse in my mind that comes often. It says, there's a cupbearer in every ministry. So I got to make sure the candy's safe for the kids. Like, I definitely don't want to give this to the kids making sure. So, you know, you take one. And, uh, oh, yeah, that's, that's okay, that's good. And, you know, I'll go back to my, my desk. Well, no sooner than an hour goes by, you know, I'm thinking to myself, you know, that sure looks really good. I'll, uh, I'll unwrap one just, just to look at it, <laughs> smell it. Well, a couple of weeks later, 10 pounds heavier, I failed temptation, okay? The fact of the matter is, we as Christians will face temptations on far greater levels and we need to understand how to overcome those things. Now, prior to the temptations of Christ, Jesus came to the Jordan to be baptized. Verse 13 tells us, then Jesus, he came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so for now, for thus it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had baptized Jesus, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, we noted, of course, in our previous studies that Matthew is recording for us essentially what the Old Testament predicted. The Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, that prior to the Messiah, a forerunner would come. This man was called of God, anointed of God to prepare the way of the Lord. That man, of course, we noted last week was John. John had been sent. John had been set apart. John had been filled with the Spirit to go to the Jordan and preach a message of repentance, calling the nation to a place of preparation because Messiah was now on his way. This, of course, was, in a, was a monumental moment because prior to John's ministry, it had been 400 years before they heard a prophetic word. Then when John came down into the Jordan, the nation of Israel began to respond to the message. Many of them, countless of them, commentators estimate up to a million people made their way down to the Jordan, responding to the message of repentance, preparing for the coming of the Lord. Well, while John was there, the Bible tells us in the scriptures that Jesus Christ comes now to the Jordan, enters into the water, and John is super uncomfortable. John says to, to Jesus, I have need to be baptized by you, and you want me to baptize you? Essentially, John is saying, listen, you're the sinless son of God. You have no sin. I have need for you to do a work in my life. And you're asking me to do this to your life? How can that be? And what a glorious moment it is for every child of God to recognize what John is saying. We have need for Jesus to work in us, don't we? We have need for Jesus to change us. 
We have need for Jesus to make us different than we are right now. This is John's confession. I have need for you to baptize me. How can you ask me to do this to you? Now, obviously, as Jesus continues, it tells us here, Jesus said, permit it to be so, for thus it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. And after that, John baptized Jesus. Now, as you read through the word of God, and you read John's ministry was a ministry of repentance, people start to ask the question, why would Jesus go ask John at the Jordan to baptize him if Jesus is without sin? The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews chapter 4 that Jesus was tempted in all points yet without sin. The apostle Paul tells us that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. So what was the whole point of baptizing Jesus there at the Jordan if Jesus was without sin? And he is. Three reasons. Number one, identification. Number two, ratification. Number three, inauguration. Of course, we know the first deals specifically with an Old Testament scripture being fulfilled in the book of Isaiah. When Jesus came to the Jordan, it was to identify with the sinner. The prophet Isaiah tells us in chapter 53, verse 12, that Messiah would be numbered with the transgressors. Jesus comes to the Jordan and he now begins to identify with the sinner. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, the Bible says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin what an encouraging word to know this morning that as we are bombarded with the various activities of life the various sins of life the various temptations of life jesus is here to help you what a glorious truth that is jesus tells us in his word he's come to be a merciful and sympathetic high priest he identifies with the sinner number two not only identification but ratification when Jesus comes into the Jordan, Matthew tells us very specifically that the heavens open up, the Father speaks, the Son receives, and the Holy Spirit anoints. And at that moment in time, the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now, very significant to the Jewish mind because when you go back to the Old Testament, what the Father was saying is, this is the one I promised you all the way back in the Old Testament. God had made a promise to Abraham that through his lineage, the Messiah would come. Jesus was a fulfillment of that promise. God made a promise to David that through him, through his lineage, one would come and he would sit on the throne of David and rule and reign forever and ever. The prophets foretold, the patriarchs spoke of, and Jesus, when he comes on the scene, the Father now is ratifying, this is the one that I promised you. This is the one that I spoke of throughout the Old Testament. He has finally arrived. The ministry is now about to take place. So it was ratification. And by the way, in your Bible, did you know that the triunity of God is seen at the baptism? The Father was speaking, the Son was receiving, and the Holy Spirit, while well, the Holy Spirit was anointing. The, the, the triunity of God is seen. Identification, ratification. Number three, inauguration. Inauguration, interesting. Back in the Old Testament, when a priest or a king was being anointed into the office of ministry, they actually would go through ceremonial washings and there was this anointing that they received for service. And Jesus Christ is now being inaugurated into the public ministry that the Father had given him to do. The Spirit of God now comes upon him and equips him, empowers him for service. Now, this is, a, this is an amazing statement, but it's a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 11. You remember in verse 1, when the Bible says, when Messiah comes, he would have the spirit of God resting on his life, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, all now being coming now upon the person of Jesus through the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Now, here's, a, here's an application. If the Son of God needed the Spirit of God to do the will of God, how much more do we? 
This is an amazing thing, obviously, because Jesus Christ is God in human flesh. And yet, according to Philippians chapter 2, Jesus chose not to exercise his divine privileges and receive this empowering for service so that he could relate to you and me. It's called the kenosis in the scriptures. He emptied himself, not of deity, but simply laid aside his exercising the use of his divine privileges so that he would be empowered and know what it's like to live in your shoes and my shoes. He could identify with you, he could identify with me, and he knows what it is to rely on the Holy Spirit for daily life. So ratification, identification, the scripture tells us, and inauguration. Well, what happens when Jesus now is empowered with the Holy Spirit and is used by the Holy Spirit? The scripture says in verse 1, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. (laughs) And when he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. So Jesus now goes from this mountaintop experience and he's now ready to start the ministry. I don't know if you've ever experienced this as a Christian, but there are moments in our life when the Spirit of God is filling, the Spirit of God is moving, and the Holy Spirit is working, and there's joy, there's, there's that kumbaya mentality, if you would, and Lord, this is awesome, this is amazing. I don't want to go anywhere else. I, I want to stay on the mountaintop forever. And by God's glorious wisdom and knowledge, the Scripture tells us He sends us where? Into the wilderness. Why would the Son of God be sent now into the wilderness. Well, interesting also to note, Mark's gospel says immediately the spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. That word drove, it means impelled. It means to send. It means to thrust into the wilderness. And the wilderness was roughly 15 square miles of cliff and ravines and rocks. The wilderness of Judea was the frightful, desolate area that ran back from the western shore of the Dead Sea. So here's Jesus now making his way from the Jordan, having this amazing moment now with the Father and the Spirit. And prior to being thrust into full-time ministry, the Father now, the Spirit, they direct Jesus, the Son, into the wilderness. Why? What was the purpose? Well, for one reason is so Jesus would be able to aid us and instruct us in how to overcome temptation. I don't know if you've ever considered this, but did you know that the Gospel of Matthew was written roughly 35 years after the resurrection of Christ? 35 years. And after 35 years, Matthew takes up the pen and begins now to document for us the life, the ministry of Jesus. Well, consider this. There were only two people in the wilderness that were bombarded. Jesus, of course, was there being bombarded by the devil. So many believe that Jesus had at some time taken the disciples aside and said, listen, um, maybe it was around a campfire. You know, Peter's got the fish on the stick. And Jesus takes the time to look at the disciples and says, listen, you're going to face the enemy. And I want you to know I face the enemy. And this is the the way I faced him. And these are the temptations that were brought to me. And this is how you're going to overcome the enemy. Jesus being the only one there that had firsthand information, no question, took the disciples aside and gave them the nuts and bolts of how to resist temptation. And I ask you this morning, are you being tempted by something? Is there something right now in your life that is seeking to sway you or harm you? I want to encourage you, Jesus can aid you and help you in that temptation. And so, verse 2 tells us, the Spirit leads Jesus now into the wilderness. And as he's led, notice he's tempted by who? By the devil. This is the first time the Gospels actually mention the devil. Just so we all understand here, the devil is a very powerful foe. Limited, but powerful. He has a personality. And some of you already know that prior to the fall, the Bible tells us in the book of Ezekiel that he was called a cherub. 
Scholars believe that he was some sort of worship leader in heaven. When he would open his wings, the Bible says there was music that flowed forth. He was a beautiful angel that God had created with a free will. However, Isaiah chapter 14 tells us his, his desire was to raise a rebellion, a revolt against the throne of God. He said, I will be like the Most High. And as a result, he took a third of the angels with him, Revelation chapter 12 tells us. And ever since his fall, ever since he was stripped of his position there in heaven, he has sought to destroy the lives of men and women because men and women bear the image of God. And so he understands, as he's studied humanity for many years, what it takes to sway God's creation. And if you don't believe the devil is real, I want to encourage you, turn on the news. He is alive, he is active, and he's destroying the lives of many. The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that he has blinded people to the truth of the gospel. People have been taken captive to do his will. From terrorism to human trafficking to the drug culture would all be linked back to the unseen world and what the enemy is doing behind the scenes. He's no question at work and his desire is to destroy not only people, but his desire is to take out the people that are being effectively used for God's kingdom and for God's purpose. And so as we look at the temptations of Christ, I want you to note three specific things. When a person is facing an opponent, everyone understands, the opponent understands, I got to get, I got to give this individual the best I got. And so typically, when an opponent is approaching someone, they're, they're going to give you the, the best that they got. For example, some of you perhaps watched the fight last night. I didn't. It was too late but uh, every boxer knows you know what I'm gonna give you the best I got I'm gonna give you an uppercut or I'm gonna get you on the face or I'm gonna I'm gonna tag 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 and then I'm gonna I'm gonna do whatever it takes to win this fight a wrestler back in biblical times understood you know what I, 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 I will use the top three moves I have in order to take this person out pin them to the floor and make them cry for mercy the enemy is the same way. And as we look at the temptations of Christ, I want you to know he uses his top three in his playbook. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are the top three moves in the devil's playbook. And if he used them against Jesus, you'll know that he'll use them against you and he'll use them against me. First of all, notice the lust of the flesh in verse three. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, Command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so Jesus, after fasting for 40 days, was hungry. He was hungry. And the temptation now comes, just make some bread. Imagine fasting for 40 days. 40 days. And at that moment of weakness, the enemy comes and he says, just make some bread. Now, if I had all power and I, was, I had the ability to make food, I totally would have made a Five Guys cheeseburger. You know, it'd been like whoosh, some fries, whoosh, a malt maybe. Whoosh, and then I would have repented later on, you know. But he comes to Jesus and he's tempting him now to make food. Now, this is interesting to me because obviously nothing wrong with eating, nothing wrong with food. However... What was the temptation? It was to act independently from the will of God. That was the temptation. You remember early on in the ministry of Christ when Jesus was lost, you were in the city of Jerusalem and Mary and Joseph found him. They found him teaching the religious leaders. And when Jesus was questioned, he said to them, why were you looking for me? How is it that you did not know that I would be about my father's business? From early on, Jesus did the Father's will. From early on, Jesus followed the Father's plan. And even in this context, Jesus was now being tempted to act independently of the Father's will. The temptation 
was to take matters into his own hands. The temptation was to act independently from the will of God. And this is a temptation we all face today. Could it be that you're here this morning and there's something that right now that the enemy is setting before you? He's tempting you to act independently from the will of God, to take matters into your own hands, to make something happen. And perhaps the spirit has been saying, you need to wait, you need to wait on me, you need to trust in me. But the enemy comes and he's tempting you to take matters into your own hands and act independently from God's will. That does happen. And if I do, the results, of course, can be disastrous. Listen, the devil will often take good things and make them bad things when they're outside of the will of God. And so he, Jesus combats this temptation by using the word when he says, it is written... Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8. Jesus says, my primary objective is not to do my will. My primary objective is to do the will of the Father. So what does the devil do? He switches up. He rebates his hook and tries another thing. Verse 5, he tries the pride of life. Then the devil takes him into the holy city. And he sets Jesus on the pinnacle of the temple and and he said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Josephus tells us, a historian for for Rome. He tells us that the area of the temple was roughly 450 feet uh, high. So Jesus is now taken from this place and being in the wilderness to the pinnacle of the temple and and the enemy now is, is now tempting Jesus to throw himself down. And of course, we know that uh, this was a display of being Messiah. Hey, he's tempting him to, to show the people who he is. If the bread was tempting him with food, then the temple was tempting him with fame. And this, of course, is a great temptation to this day. The enemy tempts people with this all the time. I, I'll give you fame. I'll give you fortune. Just, just take the step. And he lies because he's the father of lies. And isn't it interesting to note that the devil knows the Bible? He quotes scripture and quotes Psalm 91 and takes it out of context. And he uses it against Jesus Christ. And uh, anytime the enemy seeks to use the word, understand he wants to use it unlawfully. And so it's so important that we know the word of God and what it's really saying. Listen, I've always made this a practice. If the plain sense makes, makes sense, seek no other sense lest you get nonsense. So he totally twists the word of God and he's tempting Jesus now to show his authority, to show his power. Just call the angels down. They'll bear you up. Jesus says, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And so the third try, he rebates the hook and offers the ultimatum now in verse eight when he says, again, the devil took him to an exceedingly high mountain and show Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and what? Worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. So he, so he tempts him now with the lust of the flesh with the pride of life, with the lust of the eyes. Jesus is taken now and is shown the kingdoms of the world. And as Jesus is observing this, this was essentially saying to Jesus, you can have all of this. You can have a shortcut from the cross. You don't need to go to the cross. I will give you all that you came for if you fall down and worship me. Tempting him now to escape the cross. Tempting him now to take an ultimatum to the cross. Just a little compromise. Just a little. You can avoid the cross, Jesus. I'll give you what you want. 
And Jesus says, it is written, and once again, he fends off the enemy with the word of God. It is written, he says. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Now, as we bring this to very, very, a very practical level, I want to give to you seven ways in which how we can effectively resist temptation illustrated through the life of Christ. I think this, these are such important lessons. So if you're taking notes, here they are. Number one, if I'm going to effectively resist temptation, you need to know your enemy's tactics. You need to know your enemy's tactics. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, that we should not be ignorant of Satan's devices. I got to know when, I got to know when the enemy is coming in like a flood. I got to know his tactics. It's been around a long time and I need to be keenly aware what he's up to. Know his tactics. That he'll use whatever it takes to derail our life and get us, get us off course. Number two, I would say be watchful in times of weakness. Be watchful in times of weakness. Verse two, it says Jesus fasted for 40 days and notice this, that he shows up at Jesus' weakest moment. He shows up when Jesus had for, fasted for 40 days and he was hungry, it says. Being watchful in times of weakness. You know, medical doctors say that after a week of fasting, your hunger pains go away. They say that. And toward the end of 40 days, it comes back with some serious intensity. Jesus was now at his weakest point physically. And interesting to note the devil's timing that he comes at a moment of great weakness. So important that we understand that. That's why we have the church to come here for encouragement at our weakest moments, to come here for that accountability, that time to just receive from the Lord, to hear from the Lord. So important. You remember in 2 Samuel chapter 11, the Bible tells us with the man after God's own heart, it was at the time when kings went out to battle. David decides to stay back at the palace with no armor, with no sword in hand, and at his weakest moment, the enemy struck, took him down. Ruined his family, just read the account. Ruined his legacy. Ruined his testimony. Yes, he was a man after God's heart. And yes, God can restore. But there'll never be a time when we read through David's life that we won't think of David and Goliath and David and Bathsheba. Guard yourself in those weak moments. Number three, rely on the Holy Spirit. Verse one, it says, Jesus was empowered with the Spirit and was led into the wilderness. And such a glorious thing to know that, that the Holy Spirit is here to fill us and empower us and enable us so that we can weather through the temptations that we all face. The Spirit of God is, is willing and desiring to fill us. And uh, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter five, verse 18, to be constantly being filled with the Spirit how important that is. Number four, use the word of God for warfare. Use the word of God for warfare. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds and casting down arguments. Interesting to note, isn't it, Jesus? Every single time, every single time the enemy confronted him, he used the word of God. It is what? Written. Once again, boom, being bombarded. It is written. Once again, when he was faced with temptation, Jesus said, it is written. This tells me that Jesus filled himself with the word. And you might not know this. One of the favorite books that Jesus read in the Old Testament was Deuteronomy. It's the, it's the most quoted book in all of the gospels from Jesus, the book of Deuteronomy. And Jesus quoted Deuteronomy, quoted it, quoted the word of God, hid the word of God in his heart, quoted the word of God. I, I think it's amazing. The word that became flesh uses the word to fend off the enemy. That's exactly how we find victory in our own personal life is when we use the word of God. Just use the word of God. You know, sometimes my, my phone, 
has this tendency of, of popping up a screen that says, too full, can't take any more information. I mean, I like to take pictures of my kids and video and all of that. And, you know, that, that little, when, it, when, when the hard drive can't take any more, it gives you that little sign. You've got to empty this hard drive if you want any more room to be made. If you want anything else to download, you've you got, you got to make some room. How awesome would it be when the enemy comes to us, when, when, when he comes tempting us, that we're so filled with God's word, so filled with God's spirit, so filled with God's love, that when the enemy comes, he's, he gets a little message that pops up and says, too full, have no room for that. I'm too full of Jesus. I'm too full of the word of God. I'm too filled with prayer. I have no room for that. Fill yourself with God's word. Fill yourself with God's ways. Fill yourself with God's heart. Jesus shows us the better way. First John, it says, I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you've overcome the wicked one. Know the word. Be in the word. Love the word. Experience God's victory from the word. It's God's word. And when the enemy comes assaulting you, quote the word. Out loud, if necessary, out loud. Quote the word. Use the word. Let God's word be everything to you. Jesus exemplifies that to us. And yes, he quoted the word out loud. Number five, take the way of escape. You want to navigate through temptation? Take the way of escape. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, the apostle Paul said... God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape. So every temptation we face in life, there's a way of escape. Could be turn off the TV, that's the way of escape. Turn off the computer, that could be the way of escape. Or physically, get out of that situation. Like Joseph, man, run away. Get out of there. That's the way of escape. Take the way of escape. I think that's so important because sometimes, you know, we, we think, well, you know, I, I've known the Lord for 20-some years. I know the Bible. You know, I can, I can dance around this temptation and not be affected. If you do that, if you do that, you're in trouble. Take the way of escape. And I like to say this, my way of escape, your way of escape, ultimately is Jesus he's my way of escape so on a super practical level when I'm being bombarded and I need to take that way of escape what do I do I need to run to Jesus I need to run into his arms the Bible says in, in the book of Genesis in chapter 15 when, when God spoke to Abraham I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward he's my shield he's my refuge he's my fortress He's my, my defense, the Bible tells us. And I run to him and I'm clothed with him and I'm comforted and near him. And when you're drawing near to Jesus, the enemy psh, doesn't stand a chance. You stay close to Jesus. Take that way of escape. Number six, get ready for the next battle. <laughs> Luke's gospel says, now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from Jesus until an opportune time. Wow, get ready for the next battle. As long as we live in this world, we will face temptation until the day we die. So get ready for the next, the next battle. And number seven, victory is in Christ. Romans chapter eight, verse 37, you know the scripture, for we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. First Corinthians 15, verse 58, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So victory is in Christ, it's in him. some good, I think, practical ways in which we can effectively navigate through the temptations of life. Victory is in Christ. And again, on a very, just a very practical, daily, genuine, real examples. This week, let's say, you're tempted to get in an argument with your spouse. And that starts to get a little heated. You have a decision to make. The decision is, do I go into this, feeding this and, and watch this blow up? Or do I back away and go to Jesus 
and seek Jesus and ask Jesus to help me, to fill me with his kindness, with his love, with his wisdom, how to respond to this. Because if you don't run to Jesus, guess what? You're left with you. I'm left with me. And we don't have what we need to fix that. Jesus does. So we run to Jesus. That's very practical. That's how you face daily temptation, daily battle. Or let's say you're at the workplace and someone from the opposite sex basically says, starts to flirt with you and they start coming on to you. What are you to do then? As you're being bombarded with temptation, what are you to do? Well, again, on a real practical level, you take the way of escape. You hold up your hand if you're married and you show them, um, I'm married. You see this? I love my wife. So don't say that. Don't do that. And get away from that situation. That's just a fact. You, that's, that's how you deal with it. You have to be straight up. You have to be bold. You can't, you can't acquiesce to the whims of this world. You have to be what God has called you to be as a Christian. Let's say in another situation, you're working faithfully at the job. The boss comes to you and says, you know, the revenue has been amazing this year. However, if we're going to meet the quota, we need you to bend the truth, lie a little. What do you do in that situation? You stand for the truth. You've got to be who God's called you to be. And you need to look to the Lord and allow the Lord to give you what you need to face the temptations that we all face in this world. Every single one of us. Until the rapture, man, we, <laughs> we will face it. The question is, how will you navigate? Be reliant on the Spirit. Use the Word of God, the Bible tells us. <sighs> Take the way of escape. And watch what God will do.